So um, I'm going to talk about the kinds of nano materials uh, that are found in nature. And I know you've heard a lot of talks already about uh, synthetic nanomaterials and, and their exciting applications. Um, turns out that nature is way ahead of us. So whereas chemists and physicists and material scientists and engineers, you know, we started using the word nanoscience maybe 10 or 20 years ago at the most. Uh, but for millions and millions and millions of years, nature has been optimizing nanomaterials, both for good reasons and for bad reasons. And we're going to talk about both of those today uh, in the context of viruses. I know you've already heard some background uh, about nanoscience, and so I'm just going to refresh your memory um, as to what it means to be on the nanometer scale. And so you know that one nanometer is just a really small length scale. It's, it's a billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 9 meters. And just to give you a sense of the scale of what that means, uh, if a marble, like the kind you play with, uh, were one nanometer, uh, would be the size of the planet Earth. So compared to the Earth, obviously a marble is very, very small, and, and so is a nanometer compared to the kinds of objects that we're used to working with on a daily basis. Uh, so how do viruses fit into this nanometer scale? Well, here's uh, a, a virtual ruler of some other biological entities that you're probably more familiar with, starting with something that most of us would think of as already extremely small, like the flea. We always say small is a flea. Well, a flea is small, it's only about a millimeter, but that is a million nanometers. So on the nanometer scale, a flea is a huge object. And if you go down the scale of, of biology, you get to something very, very small like a human hair, which is still 100,000 nanometers in diameter, but you, know, you can see it. Once you get down to something like a single human cell, now you really can't see it anymore with just the naked eye. Uh, but a human cell is still 10,000 nanometers, it's still pretty large with respect to nature's nanomachines. When you get down to bacterial cells, now you're kind of getting down into the nanometer range, but still the average bacterium is 1,000 nanometers. And it's only when you get down to the viruses, which I'll be talking about today, do you finally hit something that we would think of as nanometer scale. About 100 nanometers for the average virus, some are maybe several hundred nanometers, some are even smaller, 50 to 80 nanometers. But this is the range that we're talking about for viruses. And just to keep going down, really large molecules like your DNA are on the order of 10 nanometers, and then simple molecules, like the kind you might study in a chemistry class, they're only about one nanometer, okay? So the viruses are, are what we're thinking about today. Now, you already know that with respect to synthetic materials, there's a lot of interest in nanoscience uh, because the size of a synthetic material actually can govern many of its properties. So in the world of nanoscience, obviously size matters. And I think nowhere is that better illustrated than by studying the properties of the metal gold. Now, we've all seen gold, we've seen gold jewelry, maybe gold coins, and so we know that at what I call the centimeter scale, or the inch scale, gold has certain properties. It's shiny, it's reflective, it's metallic, and it has a, well, gold color, right? It's kind of yellow. But if you make gold smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, ultimately getting down to the nanometer scale, and so chemists have ways of making what we call gold nanoparticles, all of a sudden gold starts to take on very different behaviors. And one of the most interesting properties of gold nanoparticles is that they're fluorescent. What that means is that if you shine light on gold nanoparticles, they'll absorb that light and give off their own light. And biologists are taking advantage of this because there are many experiments in which we would like to be able to see molecules inside cells. And one way to do that is to position gold nanoparticles on those molecules and then shine light on them. And then the gold gives off light and we can basically track those molecules inside living cells. And so these little red rings are actual human cells with gold nanoparticles inside them and then we shine a light bulb on them and they give off red light. But you'd never see that property in something like a gold coin. So that's just a great testament to how cool things are on the nanometer scale and how different they are compared to what we call their bulk properties. Okay, so one of the most exciting aspects of nanoscience from my perspective is the fact that it brings together so many different areas of science, 
uh, including all those science classes that you are taking in high school or maybe have yet to take. So how many people have taken biology already? Pretty much everybody. What about chemistry? And then finally physics. <sighs> What's wrong with physics? Is that because you take it like in your senior year and you have just not a senior yet or something like that? What's up with physics? Oh no, okay. Well, you gotta take physics. Oh no, it's like become a, like, it's degenerating into a physics bashing session, which normally I'd be right online with, but you know, not today. Uh, physics is actually really important, but it turns out that, you know, when you're in high school and even in college, there are these lines between biology, chemistry, and physics, as if they're just completely different things. And sometimes they're taught that way, but the truth is, when it comes to nanoscience, it sort of all blends together. And all of a sudden you realize that chemistry is really important for understanding physics, which is important for understanding biology, which can then help you understand chemistry. And nowhere is that convergence better illustrated than in the field of nanoscience. And hopefully that will become evident as I give this talk this morning. Uh, but not only are the boundaries between chemistry and physics and biology starting to dissolve, we've actually physically dissolved them ourselves here at UC Berkeley and at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So I think Mark just mentioned um, the molecular foundry and the molecular foundry is our nanoscience institute. It's just five minutes up the hill from here at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. So here's the building, it's kind of perched on the hillside. Uh, and this building basically brings under one roof chemistry, physics, and biology. And they're all on different floors of the building. So this floor here, there's some biologists. Here, this floor, they're chemists. And down here, they're physicists. You might ask, why did we stick the physicists in the basement? Nothing personal. It just turns out that when you're studying nanomaterials, they're so small that any little vibration will just mesh up the whole measurement. So you've got to have very, very low vibrations in your building. And that's why we stick them in the basement, because it's closer to the ground, so things aren't shaking quite as much. And these are vibrations you would never be able to detect yourself. But if you were just a nanometer-sized thing, believe me, that building would really be shaking from your perspective. So that's why we put them down here. But all these folks are working together on projects in the area of nanoscience. We're trying to understand how nature's nanomachines work and synthesize nanomachines that we create ourselves. Okay. So with that, uh, let's talk a little bit about viruses. Um, most of you are, let's see if I can get, whoops, trying to get a movie to work here on somebody else's computer and I, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's try that again, okay. Ah, here we go. All right, so most of us are familiar with viruses because we've suffered them, okay? Maybe some of you are suffering them right now. Uh, but the truth is that viruses, they are pervasive throughout nature and they have relationships with almost every organism on Earth, including human beings. Uh, viruses have been fascinating to biologists and chemists and physicists for hundreds of years, in part because we still don't know how to define them. For example, one of the ongoing debates in science is whether one should consider a virus to be a life form. It's really not clear. It depends how you define life. Viruses are different from plants and humans and insects because they cannot survive in and of themselves. They need a host cell that they infect and that helps them to replicate. So you can think of a virus as being an extremely streamlined organism. You can call it life or not, that's up to you. What I mean by streamlined is it's basically a genetic material that has a few extra molecules that allow it to infect a cell. And after that, its replication basically relies upon that host cell's machinery. So case in point, the tomato bushy stunt virus. Not something that most of you have probably lost a lot of sleep over, but if you're in the agriculture business and tomatoes are your business, you're worried about this virus because it can wipe out your crop overnight. And this virus is basically a little ball of protein as a shell, and on the inside there's DNA. And that virus infects tomato plants and it delivers its genetic content and then the DNA takes over the plant and eventually that plant's gonna die. And the reason this virus can do all the things it does is in part because of its dimensions. It's only about 100 nanometers in diameter. So this is an example of, of one of nature's nanomachines and it's been around, we don't know exactly how long, but millions and millions of years. 
Now, as I said, proteins are the shell of most viruses. And in fact, these viruses assemble inside their host cell uh, basically like a little crystallization process. Usually it starts with the cell making a bunch of individual protein molecules, then a single protein gets together with other proteins and they start to sort of one by one assemble and build this spherical shell in this case, uh, encapsulating the genetic material of the virus on the inside. Interestingly, unlike humans whose genetic material is defined as DNA, viruses can have either DNA or RNA as their genetic material. And whether they use one or the other governs, in large part, uh, how infectious they can be and how much we worry about them. Some types of viruses are actually more difficult to treat than others, and some are more amenable to mutation than others on the basis of their genetic material. And just so you know, nowadays in the biomedical profession, we worry more about the RNA viruses than the DNA viruses, in part because the RNA viruses tend to mutate so quickly that it's hard for us to keep up and find treatments or vaccines. Okay. Now, those viruses I just showed were, were examples of spherical viruses, and that's a motif that you find recurring in nature. But it turns out that viruses can come in all different shapes and sizes. Some of them are actually rather creepy, if you take a close look. Uh, for example, this is a picture of a virus that infects alfalfa. And it's got a really interesting geometry. It's kind of like an elongated rectangular structure with these sort of strange little holes. It's amazing that something like this can just form spontaneously in nature, and it has all of the machinery needed to infect um, a cell. It's called the uh, Bacilliform alfalfa mosaic virus uh, because it kind of looks a bit like a mosaic if you take a very high resolution picture. This is a picture that just hit the press a few months ago. This is a very recent discovery. It's the structure of the human papillomavirus, which some of you may have heard of. You heard of human papillomavirus, or HPV for short? Yeah. Uh, HPV is kind of a controversial topic these days. It's the virus that causes cervical cancer in women, and it's a virus for which a vaccine was recently developed by a big pharmaceutical company called Merck. And there's a lot of debate about whether people should be vaccinated routinely or whether this should be a choice. And if it is a choice, at what age should we choose to vaccinate ourselves or our children? So I'm sure you'll read a lot about that uh, on your own. But just so you know, we now have a very high resolution picture of that virus, which will certainly help us develop even better vaccines or maybe even cures for people who are already infected with HPV. And then this one, you probably have heard or at least read terrifying novels about the Ebola virus. Ebola virus is almost 100% lethal. The good news is that it's extremely rare and it tends to kill the infected person so quickly that it rarely propagates to another person. There's just no time. Very deadly virus. Uh, we work very hard to avoid such things. Uh, but it's got a really weird structure. It's kind of like a long rod with a little bulb on the end of it, but still, at the nanometer scale. So all of these shapes and sizes and varieties of viruses, they still maintain this nanometer scale. Now, here at Berkeley, we have kind of a rich history in the study of viruses. And I thought I would mention the fact that uh, one of our own former professors, Professor Wendell Stanley, received the Nobel Prize in 1946 for the first characterization of a virus at the nanometer scale. And I thought it was relevant to bring this up to this audience because you might realize that you are now sitting in Stanley Hall. Did you know that? That's the name of this building. Uh, here we are over here. This is the picture from the outside. This is what Stanley Hall looks like today, but here's another picture of, of what it used to look like. And this is a picture from 1950, hence the black and white. But actually, it looked just like this even five years ago. And what happened is the building became so out of date and wasn't really going to stand up to earthquakes and stuff like that. So we just kind of plowed it to the ground and built this really nice building. Uh, and here's Professor Stanley back in 1946 receiving his Nobel Prize from some distinguished scientists of the Royal Swedish Academy in Stockholm. Now, what did Stanley do that was such a big deal? Well, like I said, he took the first nanometer scale picture of a virus. And the virus he was studying uh, is now very famous for historical reasons. It's called the tobacco mosaic virus, or TMV. Now, back in the middle of the last century, like the 1930s, 1940s, when Professor Stanley was alive and doing research, 
people were very worried about the tobacco mosaic virus because it was infecting tobacco plants, it was killing those plants, and this was really devastating the tobacco industry, and people back then thought that was a bad thing, okay? Tobacco was a huge profit for the United States, and everybody smoked, and in fact, people thought smoking was good for you. Well, guess what? They were wrong. Uh, so nowadays, I'm sure it has occurred to many people to intentionally infect tobacco fields with TMV. But back then it was considered a problem, and so Wendell Stanley was working to try and understand what is the nature of this virus that is infecting these plants. He used a technique called electron microscopy. That's an incredibly powerful microscope that allows you to take pictures at the nanometer scale, and what he saw in those pictures were structures that looked like this. The tobacco mosaic virus is a long rod and what it has in the middle is an RNA-based genome, and the RNA is kind of coiled in a helix. And that helical coil of RNA is surrounded by a helical coil of proteins. And it was such a dramatic structure, it really captured the imagination of the scientists of the day. So here's kind of an animation of what that might look like. The proteins are all on the outside, that RNA is right down the middle, and there's kind of a hollow core shell. So there's really not much to this virus, with respect to its molecules, there's RNA and there's protein, and yet this virus can get into the plant leaf and spread and kill the plant cells and the plant dies, and it was really wreaking havoc on the tobacco industry. Now, of course, Stanley's work demonstrated that viruses are in fact nanometer scale objects, and that got everyone else interested in looking for their own virus of interest, uh, many of which um, are related to microbiology. It turns out that just like plants can be infected with viruses, and we know humans can be infected with viruses, so can bacteria. And so shortly after Stanley's discovery, other scientists started working on a class of bacteria known, uh, or viruses that are known as bacteriophage. They're viruses that infect bacteria. Uh, and what they learned by studying these viruses is that even though they look really small and simple, they're incredibly sophisticated feats of engineering. In fact, the best engineers in the world probably could not have come up with this kind of a design. Take, for example, uh, this particular bacteriophage called T4 bacteriophage. Uh, this is an electron microscope picture of that bacteriophage docking on the surface of a poor, hapless bacterium. And what this bacteriophage functions like is basically a syringe. It's a nano syringe. That bacteriophage has little tiny legs those legs can land on the surface of the bacterial cell. It has a long stalk, and then it has a head in which resides its DNA. That's its genetic material. And what that virus can do is basically sit on the surface of the cell and literally poke a hole right through the bacterial membrane and inject its genetic contents into that cell. And once the DNA gets into the cell, it programs the synthesis of new virus particles. And the bacterial cell loses its identity, and it just becomes this robotic machine for making viruses. So a lot of work went into studying these bacteriophages. Uh, and we learned a lot about how sophisticated these nanometer scale machines can actually be. But of course, if you're in the biomedical profession, I'll give you a minute to assimilate this photograph. <laughs> How many of you want to go to medical school? Okay, this is nothing. This is nothing, right? You'll see shortly enough. People in the biomedical profession, of course, have been worried about viruses for centuries because they can be massive killers of the human population. And I think, you know, when we look back in history and try and pinpoint those moments in the development of biomedicine that really affected the livelihoods of human beings, we would have to point to the study of smallpox as being quite pivotal. Now, you've probably never seen something like this yourselves in person, I'm guessing, okay? But there was a time in human history, and it was not that long ago, where everybody knew somebody who looked like this at the end of their life. And some of those people were children. Smallpox ravaged most parts of the world up until really the mid to late 1800s. In fact, if you integrate over time, it's estimated that over 500 million deaths worldwide have been caused uh, by smallpox, at least since the you know, availability of historical records. That's a spectacularly huge number of people to succumb to a single type of viral infection. And by the way, this is an electron microscope picture of that particular virus, and each of these little virus particles is about one to 200 nanometers. <clears throat> 
But you'll notice here that I say, but not lately. So the fact that in your lives, smallpox is not something that you worry much about. Uh, and the reason for that is because smallpox was the first, and as far as we know, the only virus that has been conquered by human innovation. And for that, we have to thank one of the pioneers of modern medicine, who was Dr. Edward Jenner, a British physician who was alive in the late 17 and early 1800s. He is credited with the development of the first vaccine. And that vaccine, of course, was against smallpox. So this is way before anyone had the tools of nanoscience, way before anyone could ever take a look at the actual structure of the virus. Jenner simply observed that people got sick with this disease they called smallpox, usually in populations in proximity to each other. So he proposed that it was an infectious disease. He also noticed that milkmaids who were hanging out with cows suffering from a related condition called small, uh, cowpox were somehow immune to smallpox. And he figured, well, the cowpox disease is probably similar to the smallpox disease, and maybe there's some agent inside those cows that's similar to the agent in the human, and maybe those milkmaids, by exposure to the cows, develop some kind of immunity to this thing called smallpox. And so he did a bunch of experiments and confirmed that exposure to cowpox protected one from smallpox, and hence was born the idea behind the vaccine. Now, the smallpox vaccine certainly evolved a lot since those early days of Jenner's activity, and all of that was happening in the late 1700s. In fact, that was around the time that uh, the east coast of the United States had been colonized by the British, and those colonies were developing their own medical establishments. And in Massachusetts, a number of physicians carried on Jenner's work, optimized that virus, and by the mid to late 1800s, we had what we now think of as an effective vaccine against smallpox. And in fact, you know, even back in 1966, that's the year I was born, I pulled out this photograph. So this is a photograph from 1966 from a township in West Africa in which the kids are just lining up for their annual smallpox vaccine. And basically, the entire world by the 60s and 70s was vaccinated against smallpox. So ultimately what happened is that that public health effort was so successful that in the year 1980, the world declared smallpox dead. At that point, it had been several years since any incidents of smallpox had been reported. Nobody knew anybody with smallpox, and the assumption was that we had, eliminated, we had eliminated smallpox from the face of the earth. And so, around that time, vaccination was basically ceased. So nobody here would probably have been vaccinated against smallpox. How old are you? 17. When, so when were you born? 91, okay. So smallpox for you is ancient history, but your parents probably were all vaccinated or, or mostly vaccinated, and certainly in my generation, we were, we were all vaccinated. But you know, the idea was that now that smallpox is gone, there's no point in sticking you with a needle and causing you pain and stress as a kid uh, for a, a virus that doesn't exist on the planet Earth. However, just a few years ago, uh, that notion was called into question by a program that former President Bush put into place that they called Project BioShield. <laughs> So the backstory here is that after 9-11, there became a lot of concern about potential terrorist threats and the notion that, well, what if some potential terrorist group is actually stockpiling a little bottle of smallpox? Here we are in a world where nobody's vaccinated anymore, and we know from 200 years ago that if you unleash smallpox in a susceptible population, it can wipe out millions of people. And so there, there was this fear that our unvaccinated, susceptible population in the United States, people your age, might be, you know, wiped out by some terrorist dissemination of smallpox. There are a lot of reasons to think that this might have been some kind of overblown fear. But nonetheless, Bush committed several billion dollars to this BioShield project, the idea of which was to basically resurrect the smallpox vaccine and at least stockpile the vaccine so if there were a terrorist event, we would be ready to vaccinate ourselves once again. So I hope none of you ever need to get a smallpox vaccine because the implications of that would be pretty profound. But just so you know, we do have vaccines on hand. Okay, so let's assume for now that smallpox is kind of an historical story that none of you will have to encounter, uh, but that's just one of many vaccines that the medical establishment worries about on a daily basis, uh, and many of those vaccines have been much more difficult to deal with, at least using conventional medical tools. So I just list a few here that we're all familiar with. Herpes simplex virus, this has been around forever, 
And folks have been trying to develop vaccines for a long time, and it's been very difficult, and nothing has been particularly effective. Of course, HIV, you know, human immunodeficiency virus, was discovered back in the 1980s, and that was over 20 years ago, and still we don't have an effective vaccine. Imagine if we did. Think of all the millions of people in Africa, many of whom are children, you know, who are destined to, to live a miserable life and succumb to HIV AIDS. If we could just vaccinate these populations, maybe we could do to HIV what we did to smallpox, but it hasn't happened yet. And then finally, the influenza virus, or the flu. Now, a diagnosis of the flu is, of course, not nearly as devastating as a diagnosis of HIV. But that is not to say that the flu is not an important target for biomedical research. In fact, if you just look back in history at what the flu has done to the human population, what you'll discover is that influenza virus has killed, first of all, more people than HIV. Uh, there were over 70 million deaths in the pandemic of 1918 alone, and many more since then. In fact, at that time that influenza was ravaging Europe and also the United States, uh, it was estimated that more people died from influenza than World War I and even World War II combined. So many people succumbed to influenza that people have written books about it with you know, titles like this, A Danger Greater Than War. And images like this one were not uncommon in those early days in the, in the 1900s. Uh, this is basically a big airplane hangar that was converted to an infirmary to deal with an onslaught of influenza patients. So each of these beds has a sick person in there and these poor healthcare workers are just trying to keep up. What's interesting about that pandemic in 1918 is that many of the people who died were healthy, robust 18-year-olds like yourself. No one really understands why that is. Nowadays, we think of the flu as being most deadly for very young children, little babies, whose immune systems aren't quite up to snuff yet, or very elderly people who also don't have really strong immune systems. And we think of ourselves as, you know, if we get the flu, we're miserable for a few weeks, and we bounce back and we go back to work. That's mostly true. But in 1918, something about that pandemic made people in your age category very susceptible. There's a lot of interest in trying to understand that now using some of the modern tools of biology, like looking at the genome and so on. But the jury's still out. We really don't know why that is. But it suffices to say that influenza is a very important problem, and that motivated biologists and chemists and physicists to try and understand at the molecular level how the influenza virus nanomachine actually works. So about 30 years ago, uh, people started thinking about vaccination, obviously. Uh, and it really was only about five years ago that a flu vaccine that was reasonably effective uh, was developed by people in the pharmaceutical industry. How many of you uh, get your flu shot every year or even have ever had a flu shot? How many have never had a flu shot? Okay, do they do it at your school? No? So you have to go to your doctor to do it. So the great thing about UC Berkeley is they started this program wherein at our student health center, uh, there's seasonal free flu vaccinations. And so, you know, for certain days during the year, mostly in the fall, like October and November, students can just go there and just line up during a few hours of the day and, and get their flu shots. And this has really helped us control the flu, at least in the local Berkeley environment. Um, so what is a flu shot? A flu shot is actually a weakened version of a couple of different flu strains that people anticipate being real potential problems in that particular year. One of the frustrations with the influenza virus is that it mutates really fast. So the flu strains that are out there this year are different from the ones we're gonna have next year. That means the vaccine that some of you got this year is really not gonna be very helpful next year and you have to get a flu shot all over again. Okay, so it's always trying to t kind of stay one step ahead of the virus. It's been kind of difficult, but it's pretty effective overall. Uh, in case you didn't know, it turns out that the flu vaccines are made in chicken eggs. Do you know that? So basically what folks do every year is they'll collect basically blood samples from a few people who have the flu, and they say, okay, these, these folks got sick, they have the flu, they probably have the strain of flu that's gonna spread around the world this year, so we're gonna take their blood samples and they take fertilized chicken eggs and inoculate those eggs with these human blood samples. And then the flu virus can propagate inside these chicken eggs, and then basically they break open the eggs and, and collect the new virus, and then they kill it partially so it won't, can't make you sick, and then that's, that's basically your vaccine. So this is someone who's working on making vaccines, and all these are fertilized chicken eggs, and what she's doing is kind of injecting them, punching a little hole, uh, and injecting them with virus so that the virus can propagate in these eggs. 
So maybe you didn't know that birds could be so helpful to humans in the fight against the influenza virus. But you probably do know that birds can be a real problem in trying to protect ourselves against the influenza virus. And so all of us have now heard of the bird flu, probably, right? Usually in nature, a virus that infects one species sticks to that species and doesn't cross over into other species. But once in a while, you get crossover. It's rare, but it happens. And when it does happen, that can actually lead to a whole new pandemic. In fact, people speculate that this is where HIV came from, that originally there was some relative of HIV in primates, in apes and monkeys, and that that virus somehow jumped over into humans, and then once it got into humans, it mutated and changed and eventually became HIV. Well, it looks like something similar to that might be happening with the bird flu. So birds have their own influenza virus. They've had it for a long time. Birds get sick with the flu, and it can go through the whole flock of birds, and this has been known for some time. But, you know, just within the last 10 years, we've started to realize that once in a while, the bird flu can jump into a human. And when it does, that person is in big trouble. Because unlike the human flu, which, you know, 90% of us recover from with no side effects, the bird flu, well over half of the people infected have died. The good news is that a human who gets the bird flu can't necessarily give it to another human. That's never been observed. So if you do get the bird flu, it's unfortunate for you, but hopefully won't spread to other people yet. Of course, viruses are so good at mutating, who knows what could happen in the future, and that's what everybody's worried about. But people who work closely with birds have to worry about this. And so in fact, in you know, certain areas where there is a lot of human-bird contact, there have been quite a number of incidents of the bird flu. So you know, what you're looking at here, the red, these are countries where human cases of avian flu have been reported. So you can see most of them are coming out of China, but a little bit in Africa and in other parts of, of Western Asia. Uh, and then in yellow are countries where the virus has been found in birds, which means that, you know, if the birds have the flu way all, you know, up here in, in northern parts of Europe and Asia, and that means that it's possible that humans who live among those birds, you know, could come down with the bird flu. So nowadays, not only are humans getting their annual vaccines, but, you know, we're trying to vaccinate birds as well. That only works for birds in cages. Lots of birds are not in cages, right? So, you know, we'll see how far we get with that. But it suffices to say that we worry about the bird flu. It's incredibly lethal. And so even while we develop better vaccines, we still need to think about how do we treat those people who are so unfortunate as to contract influenza virus, okay? So scientists have been studying influenza now for several decades. And as we get better microscopes and better chemical tools, better physical tools, we can learn more and more about the molecules in this nanomachine and how it actually works to get into your cells and make you sick. Uh, this is one of the classic electron microscope pictures from the scientific literature showing a human cell, which is sort of like this big uh, shape on the bottom, that's been infected with influenza virus particles. And that cell has basically been taken over by the virus. It's turned into a little virus machine. And all these little virus particles are about to sort of shoot off the surface of the cell, go find another cell, and infect that cell. So you can really get a good look at this virus. It's spherical, uh, and people have studied it in, in great detail. And so for that reason, we have a pretty good understanding of the life cycle of the influenza virus. And so that's shown here in cartoon form. So basically, the whole thing begins when the person sitting next to you sneezes in your face. Try not to do that, OK? And virus particles basically exit their nasal cavity, and hopefully you don't breathe them in. But if you do, now the virus particle is in your respiratory tract, and it's going to basically find a cell in your nasal cavity or somewhere uh, you know, in your throat or any, anywhere in that environment. When it finds that cell, so now fast forward down here, that virus is going to attach itself to the surface of your cell and then trick your cell into eating it. And that's a process called endocytosis. Once the virus is eaten by the cell, it's now in the interior of the cell. And this is where it starts to basically reprogram and brainwash the cell into making more and more virus particles. And there's a whole lot of complicated biochemistry. And so I'm not going to talk about all these gory details. You know, if you're interested in all this, you can certainly read about it. It's even on Wikipedia, which is great. But it suffices to say that after a lot of stuff happens inside the cell, eventually new viruses are born 
right at the cell's periphery, and then those viral particles just sort of bud out of the cell. They become loose, they're floating around in your mucus, you sneeze, and the whole thing starts all over again. And so once all of this was understood, the scientists said, okay, well, if we wanted to stop this life cycle, one approach to that would be to look at the very, very beginning. What happens when this virus particle attaches to the cell? Because if we could stop that very first step, then we'd shut down the whole life cycle. So there's been a lot of focus on this very first attachment process. What they discovered is that it depends on sugar molecules, of all things. So let me just introduce you to a concept. This is something that we work on in my own laboratory, which is across the street here at Berkeley. It turns out that your cells are coated with sugars. You might not have known that. Uh, and so in some ways, you could think of your cell as having an architecture not unlike a peanut M&M. And you know, if you take a peanut M&M and you just kind of bite through the middle of it, uh, you'd see a cross section that looks like this, where there's that candy shell, the sugar coating, then there's the chocolate, that's in the cell's term, that might be like a lipid bilayer, the fat, you know? And then the inside of the cell, there's all the proteins and all this other stuff. But it's that sugar coating that so attracts the influenza virus to your cell. Now, here's just a little more scientific detail of what that sugar coating looks like. So this is now an actual uh, microscope image of a human cell, okay? And just so you can get a sense of the dimensions, the diameter of this human cell is about 10,000 nanometers. So it's much larger than the virus, which is only like 100 nanometers, okay? And that human cell, as you may know from your biology classes, which I now realize most of you have taken, is, has a boundary on the outside, which is called the plasma membrane. It turns out that in the plasma membrane are embedded a variety of proteins and lipid molecules that are attached themselves to sugars. And so in cartoon form, we might represent the proteins with these big block shapes, and then the sugars are these, these tree-like or branch-like structures. Uh, in fact, there are other words that we use to describe these sugars. For example, you've heard the term complex carbohydrate. Okay, that's basically another way of describing the sugars on the surface of your cells. So these sugars are basically just kind of projecting off the cell surface, like a forest. And there's a particular type of sugar that is highly prevalent in your upper respiratory tract, and that sugar will bind to a protein on the influenza virus. So as the virus is approaching your cells, it's got this protein on the outside. The protein has a shape that makes it perfectly complementary to that particular sugar in the upper respiratory tract. And the next thing that happened is the flu docks onto the surface of your cell. So that's the very first step in the infection process. And once that was understood, you know, now you can start to come up with ideas about how do you prevent that from happening. Well, this is where chemists and biologists have come together to understand the structure of that protein and the structure of that sugar. And one of the ideas for blocking influenza virus binding to cells is to literally plug up that protein so that it can no longer attach to this sugar. So over the last five to 10 years, there have been people in the, in the field of nanoscience, in fact, that have been trying to develop drugs for the flu that can plug up that receptor. And it turns out that one of the most prominent avenues comes from the world of nanoscience. And I think it's kind of ironic because it's like, it's like fighting a nanomachine with another nanomachine. You know, there's probably a Michael Crichton novel in there somewhere, okay? So this is what people are working on. Um, it turns out that you can use chemical methods to synthesize nanoparticles that have similar dimensions to the flu virus. So 100 nanometer nanoparticles. And there are chemical techniques that have been developed to coat those nanoparticles with sugar molecules that look very similar to the sugars on the surface of those upper respiratory tract cells. And so it turns out that if you have enough of these synthetic nanoparticles around, they serve as decoys. They sort of look like the surface of a cell, and as a consequence, you can get the virus to accidentally bind to these nanoparticles, which basically diverts it away from your cells, and the nanoparticles are small enough that you can flush them out of the system. And in fact, ideally, when you sneeze, out they would go along with any viral particles that happen to be around. So this is an idea that's kind of percolating through the research establishment, still in the hands of laboratory scientists, 
It's an idea that's been tested in animal models of influenza, and hopefully we'll see a translation of this kind of technology into a human clinical setting, but that hasn't happened yet. Which means that, you know, it's not any time soon that you'll be able to take a nanoparticle drug for the flu, but hopefully, you know, 10 or 20 years from now, there'll be something that nanoscience can offer a sick patient. Okay, so with that, let me just leave you with an interesting uh, <laughs> little story. Um, throughout this talk, <laughs> Throughout this talk, of course, I've implied that viruses are a bad thing, right? They infect tomatoes, make them sick. They infect tobacco, make it sick. They infect bacteria, and they infect, of course, human beings. And all along, the assumption has been that we need to either vaccinate against them or find a drug to stop them. However, it turns out that we have every reason to believe that there might be just as many good viruses as bad viruses. And this is a revelation that came uh, really from the Human Genome Project, which finally reached fruition back around the year 2000, 2001, when the first entire sequence of the human genome was published and, and characterized. One of the big discoveries from the Human Genome Project is that most of our DNA is not used to build a human being. In fact, if you just look at the genes in the human genome, it, at most, 3% of them encode for some part of the human body. That's at most. So the other 97% of our genome is either used for other stuff or has some other purpose and we don't understand it. Now this is really great for people who wanna go into a scientific career because there's so many questions you spend your whole life and not even answer a fraction of them. There's a lot to keep us busy and to keep us entertained and to keep us thinking. But one thing that we discovered in characterizing that other 97% of the genome is that perhaps up to two thirds of it might have come from viruses. So basically, we are walking around with a genome made up of pieces from viral genomes with just a tiny little bit that encodes a human being. It's as if you know, millions and millions of years of viruses figured out a way to construct a host that can help them propagate from generation to generation to generation without even forming a visible virus particle. They're just pieces of DNA embedded in our chromosomes. Uh, so, you know, in a way, viruses have figured out the ultimate comeback strategy, which is, you know, the reference I'm making here, okay? It's the, <laughs> it's the ultimate comeback strategy, right? They figured out how to get themselves into our genome without harming us and potentially even helping us. We have no idea what these viral genes are doing. They might really help us. Maybe they make us smarter, you know, we don't know. But whatever they're doing, they're not harming us and they're there coming along for the ride as we reproduce generation after generation after generation. So, you know, we don't like viruses, but it's entirely possible that we can't live without them. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of interesting scientific research projects in your future lives as students and later as scientists. So with that, uh, hopefully I have conveyed, conveyed to this audience uh, what excites me about nanoscience. Uh, and you know, there are many different areas of the world that nanoscience touches upon. You've already heard about how nanoscience is important for energy and solving the world's global climate problems. And hopefully from this talk, you'll hear about, you'll understand that you know, nanoscience could be really important for understanding and, and for dealing with viruses. Uh, but I think above it all, the most exciting part of nanoscience, again, has to be this convergence. The fact that it brings together chemistry, biology, and physics under one roof, brains coming together and coming up with interesting ideas, uh, and this is what makes it fun for me. Um, and then finally, of course, it's the people. So I thought I would show some of the friendly faces of the scientists who work up at the Molecular Foundry. That's our Nanoscience Institute at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab. Many of the people who work with us are undergraduates, uh, many of them Cal students, and what I'm hoping is that many of you will end up here as undergraduates yourself and that we'll see you up at the Foundry and your face will end up here someday on one of these slides. Please check us out, foundry.lbl.gov, and you can hear more about what we're doing. With that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.